Welcome to the intersection of faith and the culture. This is Wall Builders Live. Yeah, you might be wondering, what does Wall Builders stand for? Well, it's not a construction company. It actually comes out of that scripture in Nehemiah that says, Arise and rebuild the walls that we may no longer be a reproach. If you think about it back then, if you didn't have those outer walls, your city was run over. Well, today, if the foundation of the country, if the principles, if the values the nation was built upon, if those are not alive and well, if we have a crack in the foundation then we're in trouble, folks. That's what Wall Builders is all about, rebuilding those walls, rebuilding those those foundations that America was built upon. And, and we've been around for 30 years now, teaching truth all across the nation, diving into the Founding Fathers documents, largest private collection of Founding Fathers originals uh, in the world. I mean, it, it's just a privilege to be able to work here. My name is Rick Green. I'm a former Texas legislator and America's Constitution coach, and, and it truly is an honor. Uh, to be here with David Barton. He is America's premier historian. I'm telling you, he knows the Founding Fathers like no one else alive today. He has read more of the Founding Fathers than anyone alive today. And so it really is a privilege to do this show with him and get to ask questions about what the founders thought and did and and their actions, the things they passed, all of that. It helps us to understand how our system is truly supposed to work. We're also here with Tim Barton, national speaker and pastor, president of Wall Builders, someone I strongly encourage you to have come speak to your church or to your school or uh, to any group. I mean, he's just really good at taking uh, these very important principles and putting them in a way that people can understand and that they can do something with it. So if you'd like to book Tim, be sure to check out wallbuilders.com today to do that. Listen, we are all about a biblical, historical, and constitutional perspective on whatever's going on in the world, whatever the hot topics of the day might be. We want to look at what the Bible says about that. How do we apply a biblical worldview to that? What's the right position from a biblical perspective? And we want to look at what history can teach us about that so that we don't make the same mistakes others have made and so that we can learn from what works and what doesn't work. And then, of course, in our nation, we want to have a constitutional perspective. So that's why we always say biblical, historical, and constitutional perspective on the hot issues of the day. We're so thankful that you're with us. Be sure and visit our website, wallbuilderslive.com, to learn more about us as hosts, about where you can hear the program. And of course, that's the place where you can make that one time or monthly contribution. All right, David, Tim, I'm always looking forward to Good News Friday, and certainly in this environment and all that's going on. So looking forward to this. Who's going first with Good News today? All right, guys. Well, the first one I got is dealing with something we have seen unfolding this last week, something that's been in the news for a couple of weeks, and it deals with the impeachment of President Donald Trump. Now, already there's a lot of controversy surrounding this, rightfully so, because the notion of impeachment is removing someone from office. Well, Donald Trump is not in office, so impeachment is already being misrepresented in this situation. Also worth noting, the U.S. Constitution says if you are going to impeach a president, then you have to have the Supreme Court chief justice there to oversee the impeachment. Well, John Roberts is not the one in the Senate overseeing the impeachment. So already this is not an impeachment process that is happening. And what Chuck Schumer said is that this is not an effort to remove him from office, but to seek him from ever being able to run for re-election or run for office again. Now, there's also a lot of problems with that and some misunderstanding of basic uh, English language reading the Constitution, because what the Constitution says is that to impeach a president, you can remove him from office and... You can prevent him from holding these esteemed offices in the future, but it's not you can remove him from office or prevent him from holding these esteemed offices in the future. It's an and thing. So if somebody has done treasonous things in office, you can remove them and then you can prevent them from running for that office again based on the treason or whatever the case is that they did. In this situation, Trump is not in office. So this notion of impeachment is already inaccurate. And then there's some weird thoughts of even constitutionality of can, can you vote to keep someone from ever running for office in the future? But here's the good news Friday about this. First of all, the fact that Chief Justice John Roberts is not presiding over that some say he declined or he refused or whatever the terminology is, but the fact that he's not there at least gives some level of indication that maybe he recognizes this is not really the constitutional process of impeachment. So that's the good news. The other thing this article highlights is that there are many Democrats, including Joe Biden, who has acknowledged that this impeachment probably is not going anywhere because there would need to be 17 Republicans join with the Democrats to impeach President Trump. And even though there were five Republicans 
who said they thought maybe President Trump should be impeached, which we think they're totally wrong. Nonetheless, that's certainly not going to get to the 17 that they would need to cross a threshold for any kind of conviction in the Senate of the impeachment that came from the House. So the good news is even Joe Biden recognizes, even John Roberts recognizes this is not really constitutional. It's a sham. It's not really going anywhere. So with all the media hype and the hubbub going on with stuff in the Senate, it's still good news to know that ultimately people recognize this is just the dog and pony show. It's not really constitutional and it's not really going anywhere. You know, it's interesting even to hear the way that media uses words on this. Um, They're seeking an impeachment of President Trump. Well, they've been for months calling him former President Trump. So why is he President Trump now? Because it doesn't have the same sound to say they're impeaching former President Trump. (laughs) Because maybe the Americans would be smart enough to recognize, well, well, that doesn't make sense. So change the vocabulary to make it seem less ridiculous. And it is interesting, Tim, even the, the, the clause that you bring out. I mean, for people who don't know what the Constitution says about this, it's a two-step thing to prevent future office. You have to impeach them and remove them from office. And then you have to say, and by the way, you can't ever hold any other office from here out. It's very possible to impeach someone and remove them from office and not give them that lifetime ban, which actually happened with the Democrat congressman who's sitting in office now. He had been a federal judge. Uh, He was impeached and removed from the federal court as a federal judge. Congress removed him. He then turned around and ran for Congress and got elected for Congress. So it's a two-step process. So what they're doing right now is, and Tim, the the point you made is great, the word and versus the word or. It's not remove them from office or ban them from future office. It's remove them from office. And then if you want to take the next step, you can ban them from future office. But you can't do that when he's not in office. And that's really a weird thing anyway to say to the American people, hey, we're going to make sure that there are certain candidates you can never vote for any time in the future. I mean, that's just kind of a slap at the American people more than it is at Donald Trump. And it must indicate that you fear him in the future or what influence he might have. Otherwise, if you thought he was irrelevant, you wouldn't be doing this. You wouldn't be trying to prevent him from ever running for office again if you thought that he's gone and off the scene. So there there are really several indications in here I think are really powerful and strong. But You know, again, good news is the chief justice is not presiding and Joe Biden doesn't think this is going to go anywhere. I I think both you guys have just missed this completely. I I think what this really is, is this is the way you unify a country. This is how you get everybody to hold hands and sing Kumbaya is that you slice and dice the Constitution that actually brings us together. And then you dismiss half the country through an impeachment of the guy that was their leader. That's the plan. I mean, that's how this didn't y'all know that's how yeah, you unify people? You know, you're right, Rick. I stand properly rebuked. I should have recognized <laughs> that right away. I, my bad. I, I totally wrong I, on that. I, I just, you got to know that many Americans are looking at this going, wait a minute, the speeches are all saying we want to unify and heal. And then the political moves are slap, slap, you know, slapping people in the face and using just crazy, crazy talk out there. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's a strange situation. And, and I'm bothered by everything you guys are are describing right now, and that is where they pick and choose these phrases out of the Constitution. They want that coveted phrase that Tim was referring to, that disqualification to hold and enjoy office. Uh, but to get to that, man, you got to do the stuff before the comma, which is remove from office, and he's not. And and the fact that Chief Justice isn't presiding, it tells you, it's almost like they're saying, we can still impeach the president when he's not in office, but we don't have to follow the Constitution to do the impeachment uh, of the president. It's just it's just crazy. It's a, it's a kangaroo court, and he just seems to get more kangarooish. Uh, quick break. We'll get some more good news for you in a moment. Stay with us. You're listening to Wall Builders Live. This is Tim Barton from Wall Builders with another moment from American history. American patriot Paul Revere rode to alert Americans of the impending arrival of the British, but he also sought patriot leaders Samuel Adams and John Hancock to warn them that the British were seeking their execution. Adams and Hancock were staying with the Reverend Jonas Clark in Lexington. When they asked Pastor Clark if his church was ready for the approaching British, he replied, I've trained them for this very hour. They will fight and if need be, die under the shadow of the house of God. Later that morning, 70 men from his church faced several hundred British in the first battle of the war for independence. As Pastor Clark affirmed, the militia that morning were the same who filled the pews of the church meeting house on the Sunday morning before. The American church was regularly at the forefront of the fight for liberty. For more information on this pastor and other colonial patriots, go to wallbuilders.com.
We're back on Wobblers Live. It's Good News Friday. And, and the good news, by the way, in that last segment, there's a lot of bad happening around this impeachment. But the good news is that, boy, the dominoes are not following like uh, Schumer and, and Pelosi had hoped. Chief Justice is not going to be presiding. Um, looks like there's not going to be uh, the votes to actually convict. And uh, and guys, before, I know you got a stack of good news, but I, I'm assuming you saw where Rand Paul uh, pushed for a vote on this immediately with regard to the constitutionality of impeaching someone that was no longer in office. And even though he lost, it was 40. There were 44 other Republicans that voted with him. So 45 that said this is not constitutional. This is not what we should be doing, which means the most they would have to convict is 55, which means they don't have enough. So that's good news as well. You know, it's good news. But, I, you know, just knowing D.C. and the way things work, I think they go full force with this because it gives their media allies an opportunity to do everything they can to make make former president look bad and worse. And and they're going to come up with maybe 55 votes if they get all the Democrats and five Republicans, which is, you know, that's 12 short of what they need. But I, I think the earned media is as much of what they're after as anything else. So it probably yep. goes straight ahead. I, I've never known them to be bound by the Constitution previously, so I don't know why they'd start now. So it, <laughs> And you it, mean the sound bites and the optics, right, where they, they still get the all of the, you know, the, the negative that they'll be saying on the floor of the Senate and the headlines absolutely. and all that, even if they don't get the conviction. Yeah, they'll, they'll take a five word phrase and have eight guests on it and do a two hour segment on, on what the guests heard from from the impeachment hearing or whatever yeah and, and so yeah. It, yeah. it you know back in the day man i've got to go back years because people don't even know what this is now if you're if you're a gen z millennial you don't know what a gospel track is probably but there was a period of time where we had gospel literature and we would go talk to people on the streets or in parks or whatever and share jesus with them and share a piece of literature with them and, and this is more like liberal evangelization efforts if you will you know which is kind of what we did as christians back couple of generations ago. This is more of their effort to evangelize more people, to accept their view that Donald Trump is permanently tainted and he's just he's just incompetent to ever do anything ever again. And if he pops up on a, starting a news network or social media or whatever, we want you to know how bad he is so that you'll run away from anything he does. So I think this is an attempt to make him radioactive as much as anything else. And again, it's, it's earned media for them that, that will give them a lot of mileage out of this. But as you mentioned last time, Rick, this is not going toward unifying the nation. That really is what a lot of people wanted was to see a unified nation. This is not part of it. All right, guys, we'll take a quick break. Uh, again, the good news there that the uh, that Rand Paul stood up and forced that vote. 45 Republicans said, no, they shouldn't be doing this, which is uh, pretty much everybody agrees that that means there's no way they get to the 67 they need for a conviction. And I've even heard some Democrat senators are floating the idea of, of getting rid of it and going to a censure or something different. So we'll see how it all plays out. But uh, but, but thankfully, um, Rand Paul and Ted Cruz and, and the other constitutionalists in the Republican caucus uh, stood up to this from the beginning. Stay with us, folks. We'll be right back with more good news on Wobbler's Live. Have you ever wanted to learn more about the United States Constitution, but just felt like, man, the classes are boring, or it's just that old language from 200 years ago, or I don't know where to start. People want to know, but it gets frustrating because you don't know where to look for truth about the Constitution either. Well, we've got a special program for you available now called Constitution Alive with David Barton and Rick Green, and it's actually a teaching done on the Constitution at Independence Hall in the very room where the Constitution was framed. We take you both to Philadelphia, the Cradle of Liberty and Independence Hall, and to the Wall Builders Library, where David Barton brings the history to life to teach the original intent of our founding fathers. We call it the Quick Start Guide to the Constitution because in just a few hours through these videos, you will learn the Citizen's Guide to America's Constitution. You'll learn what you need to do to help save our constitutional republic. It's fun, it's entertaining, and it's gonna inspire you to do your part to preserve freedom for future generations. It's called Constitution Alive with David Barton and Rick Green. You can find out more information on our website now at wallbuilders.com. We're back on Wallbuilders Live. It's Good News Friday today, and uh, I think David has the next piece of good news. I have a poll in my hand, and the headline of this poll says, New poll shows 80% of millennials oppose abortions up to birth, 57% oppose Roe v. Wade. Now, 80% oppose abortion up to birth? That is an amazingly high number. Once these guys get in office, uh, if the court does not overturn Roe v. Wade, which we think they will in coming years soon, 
Um, you certainly have a new crop of young people coming up who are definitely pro-life. And, and, and while in other areas they may not be strongly conservative, on this area they've got it right. But what I find interesting is in here is Democrats are touting polls by Planned Parenthood, for example, that says 77 percent of the American people oppose reversing Roe v. Wade. And they talk about how millennials and Gen Z are just almost universally supportive of abortion rights, et cetera. What we found really interesting in this poll was when they first asked the question to millennials of reversing Roe v. Wade, the support for it really was marginal. And then they said, by the way, do you know what Roe v. Wade does? And not really. And if we told you that Roe v. Wade legalized abortions on demand up to the moment of birth, do you support that? Oh, no, that's not what we didn't think Roe v. Wade did that. We didn't know that's what it did. And so they found the support doubled at that point. Once they knew that it meant abortions up through the moment of birth, and that was legalized abortion on demand for any reason, for any cause, for any opinion, up to the point of birth, they were strongly opposed to that. So good news is that that in the millennial generation, they are strongly pro-life. But what this does point out is that they are not well informed on what Roe v. Wade means. And that's where you see the Planned Parenthood polls have such different numbers because they're not going to define what that means. They're just going to say the right to an abortion and without definition. And, and so other, other key findings in this poll was that 7 of 10 millennials and Gen Z want, and in this part they included Gen Z, they want to vote and they think the state should have the right to determine what abortion policy is. So that's really good. 7 out of 10 support a 10th Amendment uh, position on this. Uh, And less than two out of 10 want unlimited abortion through all nine months, which was Roe v. Wade. So a lot of good numbers there. Uh, Another poll I have here also deals with uh, with Gen Z millennials. And the headline says, though Gen Z are largely religiously unaffiliated, they crave spiritual mentoring. So what you're finding is that the Gen Z particularly and millennials to a lesser degree they really are not enthralled and don't want to be around institutional religion. Doesn't mean they're opposed to Christianity. They've just had it with churches and church structure and et cetera. So what you find is that nearly 40% of Gen Z describes themselves as religiously unaffiliated. And that could be agnostic or atheist or just nothing in particular. And only about 19% of, of the Gen Z even attends any kind of religious gathering even once a month. So What's interesting is, as they were going through this, they also talked to these to the Gen Z kids and also the millennials about isolation, and found out that about sixty percent of these of these younger generations feel very isolated, and about four in ten say they have nobody to talk to and nobody who knows them well, and twenty one percent say they have no meaningful interactions at any point in the day with anyone who they feel like has a substantial impact on their life. And so as the poll went on to examine, found out that this younger generation is not at all really, generationally speaking, opposed to Bible or Christianity. It's just that they don't want to have to go into this, this structure to get it. And they were wide open to people sharing with them and mentoring them and, and, and having an influence in their life. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, here, here was 79% agreed with the statement I'm more likely to listen to adults in my life if I know that they care about me. And 87% of these young people said that they trust adults who take time to foster relationships. So what they have is no, no relationships, serious relationships in their life. And if other people would just take time to build relationships with younger generations, they, they are so open to mentoring. Now, you can't go in and say, hey, let me, let me tell you how to get saved and get to Jesus. You got to build a relationship. I mean, you just don't come in and, and throw things on them, whether it be that or political views, whether it be moral views, whether it be social views or socialism, anything else. You build a relationship. Yeah, the notion that that maybe you want to come in and solve all of their problems because you see all the things they're doing wrong, that's not going to be received real well. And I think that's probably human nature. I, I don't think that's just younger generations. I think it's people in general. But there was a, a statement made, uh, reaffirmed by several people, but I think Josh McDowell, James Dobson, different people over the years have said this, is that young people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And as you begin to invest in them and just show that you care and, hey, how's the day going and what's going on and and just spend relational time with them without trying to solve their problems, develop that relationship, 
what we know statistically is these young people are saying that we are craving somebody in our life who can pour into us, who can encourage us, who can speak into us, even help teach and train, shape and mold us, which is not always what we think as maybe older generations looking down on younger generations, but certainly we are seeing that to be true from their own confessions. This is what younger generations are saying. So that is really good news to know that there's a lot of optimistic opportunity to invest in the next generation if we will take the time to do it. And I would challenge people to do that. And by the way, it doesn't matter if you're a young person. If you're a young person and you have a biblical worldview, find people that you can invest in, find people that you can encourage and and have good discussions and maybe even mentor. Even as a younger person, you can mentor people who are older than you with the right kind of viewpoint. So if you are older, if you're like me and you got white hair, don't assume that just because they're younger, they're not going to listen to you. That is not true. If you'll invest time and and really show that you care and invest in them, they will respond. And and, and we're finding from that younger generation, age is not the factor. They, They don't turn off people just because you're older. It's whether you're genuine and build trust relationships with them. All right, guys, quick break. We'll be right back. Last segment of Good News when we return here on Wobblers Live. Hey guys, we want to let you know about a new resource we have at Wall Builders called The American Story. For so many years, people have asked us to do a history book to help tell more of the story that's just not known or not told today. And we would say very providentially in the midst of all of the new attacks coming out against America, whether it be from things like the 1619 Project that say America is evil and everything in America was built off slavery, which is certainly not true, or things like even the Black Lives Matter movement, the organization itself, not not the statement Black Lives Matter, but the organization that says, we're against everything that America was built on and this is part of the Marxist ideology. There's so many things attacking America. Well, is America worth defending? What is a true story of America? We actually have written and told that story. Starting with Christopher Columbus, going roughly through Abraham Lincoln, we tell the story of America not as a story of a perfect nation or a perfect people, but the story of how God used these imperfect people and did great things through this nation. It's a story you want to check out. Wallbuilders.com, The American Story. This is David Barton with another moment from America's history. At the time of the American Revolution, numerous other nations also had revolutions, yet 200 years later, America is the only of those nations still under its original form of government. Is this just good luck? Not according to Founding Father Benjamin Rush. He declared, I do not believe that the Constitution was the offspring of inspiration, but I am as perfectly satisfied that it is as much the work of a divine providence as any of the miracles recorded in the Old and New Testament. George Washington agreed. In fact, he declared, I should be pained to believe that the United States have forgotten that divine interposition which was so often manifested during our revolution or that they failed to consider the omnipotence of that God who is alone able to protect them. Our founders acknowledged that our national success had come from God. For more information on God's hand in American history, contact Wall Builders at 1-800-8-REBUILD. We're back on Wobblers Live. Final segment of good news today. Got time for at least one more. Tim, what's our next piece of good news? All right, guys. Really cool article I saw just uh, a week or so ago about a college student in Hawaii who paid off $50,000 of his student loan debt. Uh, He's 27-year-old, and I'm probably going to mispronounce his name, so I'm going to apologize in advance. Uh, Kamaka Diaz graduated from the University of Hawaii, and when he began to calculate what he was going to have to do to pay off his student loan debt of $50,000, he realized he'd have to pay $500 a month for 10 years, he estimated, and it was going to end up being $70,000 after the interest was figured in. And he said, I was like, nope, I'm not going to do that. So he launched a mission and he called it the race to 50K, the race to 50,000. And he began trying to find every odd job he could just to raise money. And during this time, he lived with his parents to, to save on expenses. He decided he wasn't going to eat out. Uh, He wasn't going to waste money in places he didn't need to waste money, but he began to take every odd job he could find. And interesting about this, he didn't charge a set rate for the hours it was going to take. He just told people, well, just pay me whatever you think this job is worth. Um, I'm just here to work. I'm just here to make money. And he identified, he said, I picked up groceries, cupcakes, flowers, food. I weed whacked, planted trees, cleared brush, raked leaves, painted, did dump runs, everything. And then he pointed out, and and all the things I did, it wasn't even all manual. He said, I actually officiated a close friend's wedding. I walked and bathed dogs. I even dressed up as Buzz Lightyear for a three-year-old's birthday party. 
Um, and so during the midst of this, he was finding ways to be frugal. A lot of cool parts to the story where there was a, a donor who gave him a car to use to be able to drive to, to these odd jobs. So he didn't have to walk or ride the bike or whatever else. Um, while he was working to do this, he became very connected with a lot of people in the community and he wanted to give back in the midst of him earning and doing things. So when he got his stimulus checks, he donated it to a project that was going to the seniors at the local high school for them to be able um, to get senior presents and things going on. And so he's finding ways to give back. Well, December 2020, he paid off fifty three thousand seven hundred and fifty seven dollars in 11 months. And what he pointed out is where there's a will, there's a way. But I love what he concluded with. He said, speaking of his debt, he said, I asked for it. So yeah, it's on me. It's my responsibility to pay it back. So I wanted to show people that if you live a certain way and you just work hard, you can do it. Well, now he's being requested to tell this story. And he said he plans on writing a book about how he got it done to encourage and inspire others. So really cool story of somebody rolling up his sleeves, getting it done, and doing it in 11 months. Dave Ramsey would be proud. (laughs) Yeah, Dave Ramsey would be proud. Great way to end the program today. Thanks, guys, for so much good news. Appreciate y'all digging into these stories, finding these stories for us. We have more good news on our on our website at wallbuilderslive.com. You can jump into the archives there and go back to some of those previous Friday programs. Really is good to know so many good things are happening out there, even in the midst of a, a lot of the difficulties that we're facing in our country. And uh, our duty doesn't change either way. So we challenge you to get involved at every level, certainly at the local level. Be sure and visit our website, wallbuilders.com, today to get some of those materials that you can help to educate yourself. It'll also inspire you. It'll give you hope for the future. But then you can share it with others and teach them as well. Thanks so much for listening today. You've been listening to Wall Builders Live. We stand undivided.